This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. We're well into this uh, business of precision medicine, and you remember uh, that, uh, that one of the happy coincidences of beginning to mount this effort and what's happening with, uh, with uh, networking and people's perception of uh, privacy and putting everything they've, made, they've ever done on the web <laughs> um, uh, is that uh, we have an opportunity for being able to um, uh, collect information about patients, you about yourself, in ways that could be um, uh, uh, could really be advantageous to your health, um, and and this opportunity is kind of clustered under the umbrella of uh, of uh, digital health. Uh, you can imagine, based on what we've discussed before, that with precision medicine being a data-driven. Uh, operation, the more data available, the more precise we are able to be about precision medicine, that, uh, that this opportunity for digital health, being able to collect information even passively, um, uh, more data about, uh, about uh, citizens and patients um, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, we talked last time about the uh, ethical and regulatory issues that can be associated not only with digital health but with, with the pre precision medicine uh, uh, enterprise overall. Uh, but it's something that you can be thinking about and considering as we go through uh, this talk uh, today. So to, to discuss uh, digital health, we're really lucky to have uh, Dr. Anders Sawyer's, Sawyer here. Um, uh, she, um, uh, she combines her interest in innovation with her uh, clinical expertise uh, in uh, orthopedic uh, physical therapy and exercise physiology. Uh, to provide comprehensive musculoskeletal care. She's the director of the UCSF uh, Skeletal Health Service and director of the Pediatric Bone Health Consortium, uh, helping uh, pediatric to geriatric patients, the full range, um, uh, to optimize their bone health uh, across the whole spectrum of their lifetime. So it's important stuff. Um, in addition, Dr. Sawyer plays a leadership role in, the, in digital health innovation uh, as the Associate Director uh, of Strategic Relations for the UCSF Center for Digital Health uh, Innovation, the CDHI, which you may, she would, the term she may use, um, and the Associate Director for uh, digital, the Digital Health Track of, um, of uh, a uh, accelerator program that we have here uh, to begin to move things into uh, uh, to, uh, practice and, and uh, application. Um, she is a clinical advisor to Rock Health a nonprofit healthcare IT incubator, and in 2011, she co-founded uh, the Trinity System, a HIPAA-compliant web-based uh, uh, collaboration technology for virtu a virtual tumor board uh, and multidisciplinary management of, uh, for, of com for complex patients. Uh, Dr. Sawyer has served on the UCSF IT committees for telemedicine and for web-based and mobile technology and is a member of a really important uh, NIH uh, telehealth committee. So she's operating at the, both the local and the national levels in this regard. Uh, although I think the coolest thing uh, is that she was also an expedition medic uh, for uh, world record ocean rowers uh, and, uh, and uh, developed and employed remote sensing uh, technology uh, that would allow uh, remote uh, medical coverage. Uh, maybe she'll tell us a little bit about that. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, she's now faculty advisor to the UCSF Pediatric uh, Device Consortium, uh, project director for uh, something called Robo Implant, uh, and is co-developing a safe uh, early mobility device for inpatients. Um, uh, Dr. Sawyer's career uh, includes 10 years uh, as a physical therapist, 
um, and, uh, and then she got her MD from UC Davis um, and completed an uh, orthopedic surgery residency at Stanford uh, and, a, and fellowship training in pediatric orthopedic surgery and pediatric adolescent sports medicine, uh, both of those at the Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, so after that, after that little period in the minor leagues, we were happy to have her join us at UCSF, um, uh, step up to the majors, and uh, we're, she's an incredibly important and valuable colleague, and I'm sure she's going to tell us an exciting story tonight. I know. Well, after listening to that, all I can conclude is I'm old. <laughs> I didn't realize they were going to go through that whole thing. Uh, this is a great opportunity. I really thank you, and I'm really excited to be here. Okay, let's jump in. Um, so the topic is digital health as uh, it relates to precision medicine. Um, the, really, the outline is going to be refreshing on pr precision medicine, but just the top of the wave. What role do you play in precision medicine? What role does digital health play in precision medicine? And what is digital health? Digital health at UCSF, what is that? And what capacity do we have for that? And then once again, what is your role in digital health? So we keep looping this all back around, and that's the beauty of all of this, is we now have connectivity that we didn't have before. So I'll just tee at the top of the waves. Precision medicine, the promise of it is aggregating, integrating, analyzing, and basically to tailor things to the individual instead of just the population-based medicine that we've, we've historically been able to do. We now have the ability to be much more targeted as soon as we learn how to integrate the tools that were being presented to us. And then also to the ability to establish links between the diseases, which previously were thought to be unrelated. And I would add to that the influence on diseases that were thought to be unrelated. We're starting to link those together as well. And then again, just to summarize at the bottom, all stakeholders, um, we want them to both benefit and participate in the research and the building of this. And I think it's really important to keep these phrases in mind um, because we want all of this to come together to build the knowledge network, to enable discovery, improve the clinical care, and inform the taxonomy. And I know you heard a fantastic lecture earlier from Dr. Yamamoto, but I'm bringing it just back to the forefront again um, so that we can dive into how digital health plays a role in this. And so the precision medicine proposition is to build this inf information commons, the knowledge network, and uh, to extend the use of the molecular data from the lab to the point of care to the course of daily life. And actually, with digital health, we can feed that back around again, as you'll see. And I think that besides a proposition, there's the, a whole preposition about precision medicine. Because if you look at the prepositions around you, it's because of you that we're doing this. Because we want to improve your wellness, but also your health care. And it's about you, so we need the information from you, and uh, it's for you. So in the end, we want to take that information and turn it back into directed care for you. So what keeps people from participating? I wonder about this a lot because um, I've, I've been the, the few things that we talked about, but I've also been a patient. So I also wonder, okay, when I'm asked to participate in a study, what keeps me from doing that? If we know that you're the pivotal point of us getting to precision medicine, then what keeps people from participating? It's very inconvenient at times. We have very busy lives, fear of invasive techniques, fear of loss of privacy, fear of costs, fear of being experimented on, don't know um, that others are doing it who you might respect or you might get support from, so if you had more of a community you might do it. Fear of finding out bad news or even news that's unclear. Sometimes that's worse than bad news. You get news and you don't know what to do with it. Um, and we sometimes can't tell you what it actually means. And losing control of your information. And these are actually out of um, some NIH work that was done when they're trying to help create consent forms for patients and inform consent. What are the things that people worry about? So I think with digital health, we'll be able to overcome some of those things. Certainly, collection of the data could be made much simpler if you could do it from your own home or from your daily life, and if you could do it passively rather than having to actually enter things if it were non-invasive. And we're getting to a point now where just recently in experiments, there are certain patches that can be placed, or even a shirt that was just presented to me in my office the other day, where we can do blood pressure without a cuff. This is a really new thing. We've been able to do heart rate for a long time, but blood pressure itself has been very challenging in a limited receptor way. 
Um, so limiting your travel, obviously. Provide feedback and context, and that's what was talked about earlier in Dr. Yamamoto's lecture. And also, I think you heard Pierre's lecture on the MS Bioscreen, taking really complex data and putting it into an interface that makes it understandable and contextualized for you and for the provider as well. So the ability to actually personalize, contextualize, idealize, and realize something from that data. This is a phrase that I use often. Um, how we can also use it to help support and per, uh, protect privacy. We know that you also want scientific rigor, and so we're not going to let go of any scientific rigor, even though we're playing in a space that moves very quickly as far as innovation. That's the digital health world. Um, but we promise you we're going to hang on to the scientific rigor. And allow you to control permission over what happens with your data, because that's another concern. So we can build networks and communities to support you if that's what you desire and if that's helpful to you as well. So I think that um, we're inviting you to join this revolution of precision medicine and hopefully we'll be able to support you with the revolution of digital health so that you'll have fewer negative impacts and more positive impacts if you do choose to participate in it and also when you go to receive the benefits of precision medicine. So I call digital health the great communicator. People for a while have looked at diagnostics, therapeutics, and device, and digital health was sort of the new kid on the block, maybe a new modality. I think it's more than that. I think it's the great communicator. Does anybody know who that nickname was given to? Oh, my goodness. My crowd. Okay, so um, that, is, that was the symbol for the great communicator, and nowadays it looks more like this. And so... Um, I think that most of you recognize symbols on here. The, the phone is considered the great communicator, but the great communicator of digital health is much more than that. So I'd like to explain a little bit what it is. People have talked for years about different phrases, telehealth, M health. When I was supporting ocean rowers, um, they'd be gone for five months on the Indian Ocean, and we made up a term called satellite medicine. We felt like we were one step ahead of telemedicine, because we would just get things like a photo and bounce it off a satellite, and then I'd say, your finger's broken. And so, um, but all of these terms up here have been used, and what we've done on our campus is adopt the term digital health, because you'll see the broad range of um, technologies that go into digital health. Um, there's a convergence of dig the digital revolution and healthcare and the genetics revolution. And this is a very, very exciting time if we can leverage the capacity of these technologies and do it in a judicious and secure way. And it's empowering us to better track, manage, and improve our own health, our family's health. And it's also helping your providers do that as well and reduce, uh, ultimately reduce inefficiencies in healthcare delivery. So what this should allow us to do is get to what's the phrase commonly known as the triple aims, so that we can provide better care at lower cost to more people. And then ultimately, in addition to that, we want to make it more personalized and more targeted. So all of these technologies are involved in digital health. So it didn't really make sense to us to just call it mobile health, because that typically refers to phone and tablet devices. And um, so we've expanded telehealth, interesting idea, but tele, how many people actually use the word telephone anymore instead of cell phone or whatever, Wi-Fi. So what we're doing now is using an umbrella term. But it includes wireless devices, hardware sensors, software technologies, microprocessors, integrated circuits, the internet, social networking I'll talk about briefly, the mobile and cellular networks, body area networks, which is what I uh, worked on when I was working on ocean rowers, and now we're using them a lot, even creating body area networks for patients in home care, and also for now, for I'm um, working on a technology that we're going to start using with inpatients as well. And then um, healthcare IT in general, and genomics, and now this field of phenomics, and I just heard of a new term called connectomics. I was at a, a meeting the other night of a, a neuroradiologist last night, and he showed these phenomenal technologies for actually showing the neuronal pathways in these brilliant colors, and so there's a whole field now of connectomics. Um, and so it's exciting, and it's complex, and there are lots of different ways to intersect with it, and um, what I was putting up here was just a way to show that you're already using digital health in some form, even if you're not, if you're a UCSF patient, you're using it hopefully through my chart and our electronic health record. But there are many ways throughout the day where it's already affecting your life. I'm going to step back for one second and talk about social analytics because this is a very, very exciting field that we are now just tapping into. 
there's some companies um, that are able to take um, the data that's already collected in your daily lives, so social or consumer analytics, so from your cell phone, um, the GPS in the cell phone, the cell phone usage, the, the um, shopping experiences that you're having, and start, we're starting to layer those on the physiologic data that we collect and also on the healthcare data that you provide. And we're finding some really interesting patterns. A very brief example is a study that was done in depression where they studied people with depression in their cell phone patterns and they were trying to determine is there anything in there that is observational that could ultimately be predictive um, to allow interventions. And what they found interestingly was that the number of calls didn't decrease. So that wasn't helpful at all. But actually the number of people that were called when someone was getting more and more depressed went down to one or two out of a range of much broader than that. So that was a very interesting pattern. So we take patterns like that and start layering them on the other things that we're measuring. And we're going to be able, just in data that's already collected, it's already available to us. We just have to figure out ways to integrate it and, and understand it better. So looking at digital health, this is a very uh, roundabout picture here, but it's from all the way out to sensors that we wear. It's called the quantified self movement, the early adopters that have seven or eight bands, the fuel band, the jaw, the up, all these things, all the way to the medical monitoring devices. Um, but a lot of them now are wireless. And then a step beyond this is we're making smart devices. We're putting nanotechnology and microprocessors inside things that we're implanting, including total hips, including uh, this device that I'm working on, the robo implant, which is a limb lengthening rod that's completely controlled remotely from the outside, so repeat surgeries aren't needed. Um, but we can also not just transfer power or um, sense information in, we can also retrieve information out of it. So smart devices is a very wide open and growing field very fast. So besides the implantables, we have the wearables. And then all of this information, though, is still fairly siloed off from the healthcare system unless it's directly a healthcare product. So the problem is the data is also in um, proprietary formats in a lot of these sensors that people wear for activity. <coughs> The same thing was true for glucometers, and you'll see that one of the projects that we're, uh, we're, using, we're building here at UCSF is specifically to get past that thing where the data gets walled off in a device owned by a company or is in some format that you can't integrate it back into the healthcare system. Because the idea is wherever the desperate data is coming from, it would be really, really important since you're one person if we could understand all these things about you and all the data would flow seamlessly to the clinical record. That clinical record information could go back out to you as you need it. As you're collecting data, it can come back through the system, so round and round. And so these are the things that we're hoping to be able to do and to integrate. And as we do that, they'll be feeding into that knowledge network and into precision medicine. We're going to interface and integrate. So we're doing a lot of this work on campus already, but what we weren't what we didn't have was really sort of an air traffic controller for the front lines innovators. So there's tremendous capacity on this campus from big data all the way to hardware sensors, believe it or not. We're not an undergraduate school. We're only a graduate school in life sciences and healthcare, but we actually do have quite a bit of engineering capacity on campus. And then we partner with UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz for those talents as well. And we also partner with private partners when we need to. So what we decided to do was put together the Center for Digital Health Innovation. And I'll explain why that came about. Um, as I said, we had a lot of activity going on and we felt that if we had a little bit more of an umbrella approach to it, we might be able to leverage the capacities efficiently where, where there was overlap. One of the things I found as I started uh, advising in digital health, I've been involved in digital health for about 10 years, but as I started advising uh, at outside centers, I was, started, I was really kind of perplexed at the targets that they had picked to work on. Um, in diagnostics and therapeutics, we used to call them therapeutic targets, like what's a problem? What needs to be fixed? So the same thing in digital health. So I started advising, and one time I went to a big report out day, and I remember saying to the person on stage who was jumping up and down because they just got more funding, and, and finally I said, well, what are your metrics for success? And it was an app that was supposed to take away back pain put a little sensor on the back and it showed a stick figure that when you were slouching, the stick figure in your phone would slouch and then it would remind you to straighten up. So I raised my hand and I said, well, what are the metrics for success? And they said, well, we've had this many downloads and we have this much funding. And I said, does it work? And, 
And a 20 year old said to me, well, I've been wearing it and my back doesn't hurt. <laughs> and I thought, I don't have the heart to tell you. I'm a physical therapist and an orthopedic surgeon. And I would like to see some studies on this. So, um, so what it made me do, though, it made me realize, and I started asking those questions more and more, and I realized what we really needed was more of an interfacing between the fast-paced tech community that was jumping into this and wanting to help solve problems, which is fantastic, and the front lines providers and the front lines innovators. We needed to merge those communities. So that was one of the things that we did. Um, I think, though, that what we found was there are some tensions, different cultures. They move very, very fast in the tech sector. We're an academic institution. So I would go out to Rock Health and advise, and it would be the metabolic rate of a mosquito. And I would come back to the university and do some of my work here, and it was more the metabolic rate of an elephant. And I thought, well, we're going to have to find some alignment, just even on those things. So we've had a fantastic run in the last uh, year and a half of bridging communities with different partners. And we've come to realize we need to provide the front lines innovators with more fertile soil. And so we're going to do that through this innovation center. And we're developing effective healthcare solutions, finding out our opportunities and our advantages to bring to this are that we're on the front lines. We feel the pain points. We see the pain points in our patients. We know where the gaps are that we need to fill, that I think we can fill with a combination of technology, process, and personnel, not just technology alone. And we can conceptualize solutions that will either fit into the healthcare delivery system or decide where it needs to be disrupted as well, because we're right on the front lines of it. And then figure out how it's going to interface with everything else that has to flow in that patient's life. And then the other big strength we have is evaluation. And that's been missing, really missing from a lot of the technology development so far. And so we are uh, deeply steeped in the ability to do evaluation. So we'll be asking everything we're building, does it work? And we're going to ask many points along the way. Um, and then the ability that we have to develop these things is sometimes slowed down because we don't have everything we need across the field. So we're going to partner with the areas that we need so that we can move things out of the university. We have a lot of amazing things that have been built here, but they might stay in that lab or they might end when the grant ends. And what we really need to do, that we need to get those things out to more people. If they work, we want to scale them up and have more people be able to take advantage of them. So translation is the phrase that we use for that, to scale things up and out of the university. And then thirdly, we want to develop innovators, not just technologies. So a big part of our mission is helping people become cross-pollinated individuals. So whether they're in school of medicine or pharmacy or nursing or dental, we want to also help them start looking at not just how to embrace healthcare IT, because believe me, they're fluent in it. They've grown up in it. But what we want them to understand is how do they problem solve? How do they create solutions using all the, the tricks in the shopping cart that we now have available to us? And how do they think about uh, solving a problem? So we're trying to create more effective healthcare solutions by creating more effective problem solvers along the way. Um, so this is how we're planning to foster uh, innovation from the inside. As I said, there are some. Uh, some things that we need to work on a little bit more. We need to be a little bit more agile. So we've created a little bit, uh, we call it an oasis of agility in the Center for Digital Health Innovation. But we also maintain our scientific rigor. If you talk to tech people, they make an MVP, a minimally viable prototype. They test it, reiterate, test it, reiterate. You can't exactly do that on patients. I don't think you want me to try a new screw every time you come in with a fracture. You'd probably like me to do what I know works really, really well. So, but we can do that <clears throat> in low risk situations and create pilots where we can test an interface and see if the user even engages with it in a, in a mobile platform, et cetera. So there are many ways where we can find alignment. Um, and then the other things that we're working on are how do, we, how do we learn new business models? How do we learn to create business models around these things? Because even if it's a non-for-profit, a not -pro excuse me, a non-for-profit, good of the whole global health type implementation, you still need some way to sustain that so that it doesn't end with the next grant. These are things that we're learning. These are many, many pieces that go into creating digital health innovation and creating a new technology. And as you can see, a lot of those we find partners for. We don't necessarily have on our own campus. But the goal is to get from idea to impact. 
And all along the way, we're going to be doing evaluation. So a big part of what we're doing, as I mentioned early on, is partnering. And this was the initial website that we put up. And we're just rolling out, uh, going through a new branding. And we'll have a new website. You'll be able to interface with us. You'll be able to say, I've heard about this technology. What do you think of it? How will this work? Or I'm interested in giving, uh, participating in the precision medicine study, but I'm really nervous about such and such. Can you reassure me about that? So we'll be able to interface with people, and we really are working hard on making a, a, a porous membrane from the academic institution outward. So the four pillars we're working on are innovation, validation, integration, and education. I'll just go through these briefly because I want to talk about some of the technologies we're doing. But it's basically to be a virtual door so that people can come through, public, private, whoever wants to, and get information about digital health innovation or technologies. We're leveraging existing capacity, which I mentioned to you before. Our CTSI is a phenomenal uh, research resource for us. And also, there's a component in here called Catalyst, which I'll talk about in a minute. The Office of ITA is where the licensing and the intellectual property, the contracts, and also the Center for Entrepreneurship is. The information technology is an area where we actually have an in-house tech development shop. Uh, design and development shop. And that's very important for us and has been allowing us to do some of our, uh, our web-based and also our mobile-based technologies. And uh, we actually have several in the iTunes store. We've built over 50 apps on campus already. And so there are a lot of them that are available publicly already. And all of them um, have come out of research protocols. And we're also creating an online proposal system so that our frontline innovators can get their proposals evaluated very quickly. And we can find out where the gaps are and help them fill the gaps sooner and move things along more quickly. The Catalyst is our accelerator program. And what this is is a program where we bring in the proposals in a more formal way than online. And we, put, we have 130 external advisors from different types of industry who sit with us and review proposals. And we're able then to um, figure out which proposals should move forward, which ones have legs that can go on, and what the gaps are that need to be filled. Then we actually build a little team for them with these advisors from the outside. And in eight weeks, they go through a development process where they make major leaps. And then we, they compete for an award at that point, for financial award. So this is just a quick example. This is a phenomenal researcher and surgeon, ob gyn surgeon, Dr. Leslie Subak. And as an example of some of the things we do here, she's been for years working on urinary incontinence. So she's taken some evidence-based interventions, which were paper-based and timed voiding, as well as diary, have both been effective in urinary incontinence. And she translated those to a mobile device, because we do know that if people have access to these things, they're more likely to continue with it. They're also more likely to take advantage the more frequent that the intervention happens. So she's moving this to a mobile platform. Again, it still needs to be validated. Um, but it had to be developed first in a way that was engaging to a person. So she, we partnered her with uh, a couple of key figures, a key opinion leader in digital health technology, David Shaywitz, who blogs for Atlantic and Forbes and who's one of our advisors here. He's interesting to follow if you get interested in, in looking at digital health technology as something that you'd like to follow along on. And David Kim, a physician himself, also uh, has been in business development and is a VC, and he's also involved in his own startup development. So she, they were able to pivot her around and bring her to where she actually had an MVP by the end of it, competed for award. Now the NIH has contacted her and wants to use her platform for a large multi-center network of urinary incontinence um, projects. So our whole goal is to help people make leaps. This is a global health uh, intervention. And I'm just showing you these as examples of things that digital health can do and how you can see the data. They're not only pre providing information to the patient, they're providing a way for them to track what's going on with them. And then we're able to also trigger an intervention. So we call it teach, track, and trigger. And not all mobile apps have this, but we work hard on it here so that we have a full loop. But imagine if they're entering data, there's data. So that data then feeds in to the knowledge network. And we can layer that in with some of the other information, particularly in the ob -GYN world, some of the genomic information, family history, patient reported data, et cetera. And then we're building that knowledge network. And then ultimately, the goal would be, not only would that information be uh, predictive, could be prescriptive ultimately, um, in the sense that we could create treatment algorithms that sometimes get delivered right at point of care. 
So that's how all of this keeps coming back and intersecting. And this is a community in Sao Paulo. You'll start learning about this a lot more because I think they're going to displace all these people for the Olympics. Um, but right now, there's no information on millions of people in these slums from a healthcare standpoint. So um, Jay is actually a hospitalist at SF General, but who has a hobby of coding. And so what he decided to do was do an intervention because he's passionate about this region. And it was to provide the community care workers with a way to gather data. Just like Dr. Yam, uh, Yamamoto has talked about several times, is if we don't have that information, we're not going to be able to add, add to the population information, which will then allow us the ability to put uh, an individual's information against that and learn from it. So he's created a way for these community care workers to start getting information on these patients and follow them and get back to them and give them the, the treatment that they need because many of them never come to the clinic, but they come to the marketplace. So these people are in the markets, but they had absolutely no tools to track, to track any information. So we partnered them with people through different disciplines. This is a, a gentleman who started, Eric Levin started Rip Road, which was the texting, it's a text-based platform for a lot of patients who don't have smartphones, 50% of the in the developing world of people who have phones don't have smartphones. So the text messaging is a very effective healthcare intervention tool and data collection tool. And so he actually developed the SMS platform, the texting platform for American Idol when he was at AT&T, which launched texting in the United States. It had been used in other world, uh, third world countries for a long time before us, but that's what really caught on here. So it's very interesting to watch the social patterns that are also feeding into the improvements in healthcare these days. Anyway, he went ahead and developed uh, a platform, and it's being used right now in the slums. And he's gathering quite a bit of data, and he'll be able actually to help those people, because he's now also able to look, where are they going? Where are they moving to? And as the disease clusters are changing, because the patients are moving, they're going to be able to get information about that and, and help from a population standpoint as well as an individual standpoint. Um, so we also have, in our incubation process, we also have a portfolio of four projects that have been on the university uh, for quite a while, maybe two to three years, and have risen to a level where they really are ready in a year or two to move out of the university and really uh, scale out. One of them is CareWeb, and this is a collaborative patient-centric communications platform. Simply, if you're in a hospital bed, how many people have been in a hospital bed? You're going to understand this. People come in and out of your room all the time. They change shifts. Even if you really like them and you do get to know their name, they're going to be gone in a few hours. The physicians may come in a pack. They may come from different disciplines. They may not talk to each other. So what I found as a patient is it's very hard for any one person to have all the information. And I don't know who to ask which questions of. And I'm actually in the business. So this is a tool where the whole team is going to be connected and connected in a very easy way on a mobile platform. And it's right now done in a haphazard way through the care team, but this will also include the patient and the family. So the communication then will be linked in a way that makes it much more cohesive. It also takes away this doctor to doctor, pager, voicemail, email, text, and, uh, and then web. And a lot of those aren't secure, and a lot of them aren't tracked in the EMR in any way. So this solves several problems for the AIM patient. Tidepool was the one I mentioned earlier. It's the glucometer solution. This started from passionate endocrinologists, two passionate fathers of type 1 diabetic children. And what they found is these glucometers that measure your blood glucose and tell you what to take, and they're used at home, they don't talk to the medical record. You can't get the data from them except in a very simplistic uh, presentation that the company made up. And so the data is kind of frozen in there. It's presented in ways that aren't very useful to the patient or to the provider. And so what these, uh, these were also serial entrepreneurs, these two fathers, and they're all like, this is our data. We need this. And the provider's like, I need to see the data better. And the patient's looking at this and going, this just doesn't mean much to me. I mean, I, I know to take this much insulin, that's it. So what they did was they've created a hub, and it's a combination of hardware and software, that can get the data now into a common hub. And it's, in a, it's going to be in an open platform and in an open source so that it, it will not be locked up in a company anymore. And it's actually a phenomenal project that's now turned into a nonprofit. 
and it's continuing to be developed here in proof of concept, but it's already being utilized out in other communities as well. So this is a very exciting project, and it's an example of how we need to connect the data, the data dots. And Healthy Heart, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. This is one that you might have heard about already. How many people heard of the Framingham study? Great. So that was a phenomenal effort to collect a lot of information over a lot of people, but over a long time, so longitudinally, which is extremely valuable. But their numbers pale to what this group's been able to do in a very short amount of time because we have a whole different mechanism of reaching patients and collecting data and communicating with them. So I'll tell you about that in just a second. The one on the bottom is Trinity, and this is precision team care. So compiling data from disparate sources and putting multiple experts around it and then making a decision about that patient very quickly. So we put the pertinent data together with the experts from different disciplines and the evidence from clinical decision support tools. And it's a secure online space. And it really multidisciplinary care is the gold standard for chronic and complex disease, but it's expensive the way we practice it, in person and synchronous. So in our model that can support synchronous but can be done totally asynchronously, we're turning cases around instead of four to six weeks, turning them around in 48 hours, uh, critical decision-making processes like in tumor board. So the Healthy Heart Study, this is using big data to reduce heart disease. And it's a very exciting project that has been born out here on this campus and is now uh, evolving very rapidly. And you can go on tonight and log on and become a participant. You right there with your phone can, are you already signed on to it? It's very simple to log on, and it's very simple to participate, and you can participate to whatever level you want. But it's a perfect example of digital health intersecting with personalized medicine, as you can see in this slide. So the cost of clinical trials continues to go up. I just heard I've, we've been approached by several large pharma companies to say, can we start using some of your innovations that you're using in our clinical trials? A study for a drug that went on for seven years costs $90 million a year. So it's no wonder the cost of the drug is prohibitive by the time it comes out. But with this kinds of, these kinds of innovations, we can reduce the cost of drugs and also move them through the R&D more quickly. There's also just a fatigue of recruited individuals for these studies, so the ability to extend the reach of recruitment and not have people drive three or four hours, particularly cancer patients who are you know, very, very compromised, have them come into the center for their clinical trials, all of that. So much could be done in the community if we can find ways to have standardized um, uh, data collection tools with technology. So this uh, Healthy Heart study kicked off, and it's to collect big data for creating robust prediction algorithms. Now remember from the MS BioScreen, you can have a lot of data. You can have a population of, they had 600 patients of MS. 600 doesn't sound like much, but for an MS population, it's one of the largest sets in the world. And you can take an individual's data and layer it against it and look at it. All that is at the moment is observational. Until we learn a lot more, particularly in a longitudinal, longitudinal fashion, it can't really become predictive, let alone prescriptive. But you've got to start somewhere. So by getting these large data sets together, our ultimate goal will be creating these predictive algorithms. Um, and this is done with simple online recruitment and e-visits. And you'll see when you log on how simple. They've done a beautiful job with the design, which is incredibly important for user engagement. Um, and then they're going to combine it with sensors as well. So mobile sensors that help track activity as well as certain sensors now. You know, a lot of the, has anyone tried any of the food um, apps like Lose It? Yeah, so it, they're kind of labor intensive. So what happens is there's good engagement, but it's up to you. Even though they've done clever things like barcode scanning and things, you still have to enter data. So it's great engagement and tremendous drop off at six months. And that's true for many, many, many of those uh, health-related apps. So we're also trying to study how do we get engagement, sustained engagement? How do you get that engagement to translate into a behavior change? And then does that behavior change translate into a different health outcome? We still have a lot of those pieces to lay down. So they're creating a whole new paradigm for conducting clinical research and delivering care. So very... Uh, beautifully designed study and it's really nimble and they keep adding on new pieces and they're not building every one of these things themselves they're partnering with existing technologies that have already shown to be quite successful and that's another clever approach to this 
So here's the simple user interface. It makes it really easy for patients, patients to engage and get started, but it's also for patients to see and get information back because we know that's another thing that not only incentivizes patients to do something different because they can see what's going on with them where they may not feel it unless they had chest pain, which is a very late finding. Um, but what, what they can do is they can actually see some information about themselves. It also helps them want to enter more data because then they, they get more information out of it. So, and then that adds to the knowledge network. So it, it's a, a very wonderful self-feeding cycle. Um, and this Ginger.io is the company that I had talked a little bit about earlier about just adding social analytics to this um, and really looking at movement patterns in the community, shopping patterns, cell phone use, all of those types of analytics being layered on to give us a better sense. And that's a field that I'm particularly interested in from the rowing work, but from my cardiac rehab days of lifestyle modification. And as a physical therapist, I think we need to develop a system that helps us understand life flow. Like we have workflow and all these metrics around workflow, but there's so much that influences a person in their daily lives outside of the hospital that we don't capture and we don't measure when they come for clinic visits. And so much of that is really important and lost information. So I'm, we're, many of us are working hard on this idea and I've coined a phrase called life flow and creating a module so that we can start to understand better how, how do you move in your daily lives, what challenges do you meet physiologically and psychologically, and how do you meet them back? And those are things that will all be very important, and we know they influence your health. And we just don't know how, we don't know how to help you with them. So instead of me just doing a, a six meter walk test with a patient, I'm putting monitors on patients in their home so that I can understand better. If I say a patient can get on and off the toilet independently in the hospital, but their toilet's four inches shorter at home, they can't. So it's much more about a patient's real life setting and, and understanding uh, better how to, to plan for that and how it affects them. So they also do collect DNA in a swab, simple kit that gets sent out. Um, and also, this is, um, if you had it done in person, you'd have your blood drawn, but they're doing DNA samples with a spit kit that you then just mail in. And the enrollment, it, they were expecting, they were going to try to go along pretty much on a linear path here for a while, but they all of a sudden got in the Wall Street Journal, and you can see what happened to the enrollment, <laughs> then the SF Chronicle. So they've already um, got an enrollment that's outstripping the Framingham study, and they've, they've been up for less than a year. So it's just the power of the ability to use technology in an innovative fashion. And there are all different types of cardiac conditions that they're tracking. So people uh, from all different aspects are very interested in this. And then we're building in um, validation against databases. We're making sure that the, the tools that we are using to measure need to be validated against ones that we've been using for many years, et cetera. We'll develop new ones, but at least we've got to make sure that those are working as well as the old ones. Um, and then the, again, linking things back together, so linking the sensors, the hardware and the software together, and the social analytics together, but then linking all of that back to the healthcare delivery system. And interestingly enough, a lot of payers, of course, are interested in this type of information. So linking all the stakeholders in the healthcare and wellness space is the ultimate goal. And then validating the self-reported data in the EHR, that's another very challenging piece for us. Um, the self-reported data, are you familiar with filling out those history forms when you come in? Interestingly enough, they don't automatically go into the medical records. So we're working through one of our big supporters here, Salesforce, in certain disease states to help us get that self-reported data into the record because we know that affects your health and we don't have a good understanding of how a lot of those pieces work because they're, they're data gaps when you have to do transfer of data or copying data over and over. So under the evaluation pillar, the other thing I mentioned was that we need a lot more research. We have tremendous capacity on campus for this from the health policy study, the CTSI, the resource research hub. We're also partnering, we're also building the Institute for Computational Health Sciences here, and we partner with other groups. The Citrus Group is a combination of four of the other UC campuses that do innovative uh, technology research in the interest of society. So bringing all these capacities together to help us better study these technologies. 
there's um, a paucity of information about how to do research and evaluation in digital health technology. So our campus is leading the way, and we're putting on the first conference in that in uh, end of April of next year, a national meeting on how do we do evaluation in digital health technology. It's a bit different than the traditional randomized clinical trials that we're used to. So we're learning while we're working. Um, and we also work a lot with outside companies that come to us for very different reasons, but we want to embrace that because there are a lot of things being built on the outside, and that's good. We need a lot of things built. We need new perspectives, but we also need to help them understand what are really important problems to work on and to partner with us in evaluating those technologies. So that's why we, we actually have a, we embrace that type of work. And that, again, would come through an online proposal as of two weeks from now when the new website goes up to make that efficient. Now, the integration piece is critical. We're working very hard on building a platform that's going to integrate all the things I just talked about. So right now, if you come to us from a different center, we have a very challenging time even getting your medical records, let alone something out of a fuel ban that you've been wearing for the last three weeks that may have some really important meaning to us. So this whole idea of creating integrated platforms is really, really important, and it's an area where we're spending a lot of effort. We're not just concerned with integrating with our own EMR, but we certainly want to do that as a priority, but we want to make sure we can get information from either the health information exchanges that are being built or from some of the other legacy systems and also from any of the data collection devices that you choose in your lives, your daily lives. So we're spending a lot of effort on that. The other piece of integration is building the digital health ecosystem in the community and partnering inside and out. Um, so I just want to spend a second here on this platform as well because I showed you this slide earlier, but what's really important about it is every step of the way when you transfer data, a couple of things are at risk. One is parts of the data could be lost or it could be put in a different format and it becomes erroneous. So accuracy is very, very important. The other piece that's extremely important is security because every time we make a transfer of data, there's an opportunity for some sort of an intervention and a break in security. So just to reassure you that we're working very hard on those things, and in order to make it useful for many agencies, not just our own, we're working hard with open platforms as well. And OpenM Health is a large open data platform for mobile technologies that was founded by two people here at UCSF. And it's so that people developing apps can put their data in a pass-through through the OpenM Health data uh, platform. Um, so the last piece I'll talk about here is just education, and this is where we're really, really determined to not just use education, not just use the tech-enabled education, which we're building a lot of tech-enabled tools for education, but to understand what it takes to help and support people in creating new solutions in healthcare and creating those cross-pollinated individuals. So we just have launched the first health tech class in, in our curriculum today. We had a very exciting session where we had one of our outside partners, IDEO, which is a, a pretty famous design firm. Uh, I partnered them with one of our, our internal groups who's building, um, Danielle Schlosser, a very promising researcher. She's building a mobile platform for adolescent schizophrenic patients. Very challenging population. But they have all the same wants and needs of any other adolescents. They just have a very hard time engaging with community. They have a hard time initiating. They have a hard time remembering the experience of something that was really good for them. They can't recall that and initiate to try to do that again. So she's building um, a mobile device so that they'll actually be able to frequently engage with this and, and get reminders of all of the things that would incentivize them in that way. And in order to make it effective, she built an MVP and she tested it and she's one of our Catalyst awardees. And she had a room, one of her evaluation pieces was a focus group and they all looked at it and said, well, we really like you but we would not use this. And so she realized that it was a completely bland UCSF blue user interface and it really had nothing engaging for them. So we worked hard on building up the components of her protocol and then we went to IDEO. And so they've been working very hard in figuring out uh, with focus groups again, what would be the design pieces that would help with engagement? This is a very niche population, but the lessons we learn about engagement from design in that population will transfer to many others. 
we all have problems initiating, we all procrastinate, we all have trouble going back and doing good things over and over. It also tells us about um, how important design is in healthcare and in where we're trying to get people to make behavioral changes that are good for them but hard for them to sustain. So we're learning a lot about the intersection of design and healthcare technology and we've actually created a relationship with IDEO. They helped put on the first precision medicine conference here and more than that now they're helping us with building and designing our individual technologies and um, we have uh, some very promising projects coming up with them. I learned from their, inter their interview techniques some things from that field that I think will transfer and be very important in our interview techniques with patients. So that's what I call hybrid vigor, where you learn from one field some techniques they use and they play out very well in another. And we learned this by observing the way the patients reacted to them when they had been through many, many clinical interviews before. So I think that's also an exciting piece of this, is the, the cross-disciplinary lessons. Um, and so we're building tools here to enable education. This is now a mobile-based uh, neurologic exam tool that's been built here. We're using, obviously, a lot of technology in the training, and also um, we're starting to bring in any new technologies that we, th we think will help. We'll work with the students on doing some test cases with them. The, the students are very, very excited about creating solutions with technology because they feel uh, it's so obvious to them in other parts of their life how technology has made things easier. And we're a little bit behind on that, but they're going to help us move fast. Um, so how is digital health changing? Well, it's changing in that now there's, there's this acceptance that there needs to be more evaluation. It's come in a funny way. The consumers have been demanding it. Consumers are very savvy, very, very important about what do we need. We need to know if it works. The other group that's coming to us is the venture capitalists. They're saying, does this work? So the venture capital field is very interesting. They've been a little bit hesitant to in invest in the technologies. Some have gone in. Others have been saying, let's wait and see how this goes first. But as the other investments in life sciences have dropped back, the digital health space has really increased. But they really need to know if these things work. We need to know, as healthcare providers and patients and people who love their family members, we really need to know. And we think that's one of the strengths we can bring. Um, interoperability, we've talked about aggregation of data. This is all the things that Dr. Yamamoto spoke to you about. We also need to visualize the data better. We need to make it accessible. So we may have some phenomenal genetic and genomic databases, but if that doesn't get to the front lines and to the provider in a way that makes sense, it's not, it's not much help. It's, help. it's helpful in drug research, but it's not much help in actual treating of the patient that day. We also need to make it audience specific. And we talk a little bit, we've talked a little bit about the cultural competency pieces of these so that things are put in not just a language that's familiar to the patient, but a vocabulary. Or maybe it's not text, maybe it's audio, maybe it's visual. So making audience specific information is important. And then putting it in context. What does that mean to me? What does that mean? Part of what that means, you, we have to understand better what's important to patients. The same thing isn't important to one patient as it is to another. So what is quality of life? That's not something we have a great understanding of. So trying to contextualize it in a way that's meaningful to the patient. The analytics I talked about briefly, getting from observational to predictive to prescriptive, very difficult. Takes a lot, a lot of data to get way out here and actually longitudinal data. But we have tremendous power now by combining databases um, and looking at analytics by layering, which we weren't able to do before. And all these, now these new tools in clinical trial innovation. So the landscape in healthcare is changing dramatically because of the digital health innovation. And I think that you can understand some of how it's affected your life because you can look up things on the internet now that you really never had access to before. Um, but beyond that, you're going to be able to start monitoring yourself. You're going to be able to start querying that data. You're going to be able to intersect that with your ability to now contact your physician electronically and say, wow, what does this mean? Um, and it's also a time that where healthcare is changing. We want to get better care to more people at lower cost. And in fact, value-based care is the direction that the whole system is moving. It's moving more towards collaboration, transparency, and ultimately towards this targeted precision medicine. All of these things are going to be dependent on the great communicator to make them work effectively. 
So in summary, digital health and you can affect your wellness, your health care. It can also increase your capacity to participate in the building of the knowledge network, which ultimately feeds back into your own health care. I think with digital technology, we can help you uh, in the collection of the data, make it happen in your daily routine, not that you get in the car and go have your blood drawn, and make it so that it's time efficient, it's non-invasive, provide you the feedback and some context so that it's more meaningful to you, real time, not in a month when you get back in for your next checkup, and maintaining for you the privacy, the scientific rigor, and your control over permission of what happens with it. And then also, continuing to strive for this personalization, contextualization, idealizing it, like ultimately, what do we really want for you? We really want the best health outcome for you and then helping to realize that happen. And that is a really big part of why we work really hard on precision medicine here. Again, it's because of you that we do it, it's about you, so we need the information, and it's for you so you can benefit from it in the end. So we are all about partnering um, to get this hybrid vigor and to get to uh, building the knowledge network. Okay, well thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.